I'm Ken Beatty, and I'm a writer. I'm traveling the world looking for the relationships between people and plants. Plants give us life. We depend on them for food, shelter, clothing, and medicines. We even depend on plants to explain the unexplained. From the mysterious to the everyday, plants create folklore. This week we'll travel to England, discovering plant legends from the forest to the churchyard, then to the jungles of Malaysia, searching for the carnivorous monkeypots, but first to Corsica, home of the asphodel and the mysterious islanders known as the Mazari. Corsica is part of France, a mountainous island that sits in the middle of the Mediterranean. There are 360 villages and towns on this island, and I visited the coastal town of Propriano. Historically, Corsicans are very religious and quite superstitious. Most are Roman Catholic. Now, the village cemetery always sits in a prominent place. In Propriano, it overlooks the sea. Legend has it that the local Mazari was someone who had the ability to foretell the future. It was believed that this Mazari always knew who in the village was in danger of losing their life. The Mazari could see that person in the face of a dying animal. Few people knew who the Mazari were, or if they still exist today, but the legend lives on. At the root of the legend is this plant, the asphodel. It grows wild all over the island. Thomasine Rotili Forcioli is a school teacher who's been studying the culture and folklore here. She's collecting dried asphodel stems to teach a group of children about the legend of the Mazari, as well as the practical uses of the plant. La faudelle était en effet utilisée dans l'alimentation des hommes et des animaux. Alors pour les hommes, eh bien, elle était utilisée dans la, dans la soupe aux herbes. Euh, on utilisait les tubercules simplement. Et elles, ils étaient utilisés exactement comme des carottes. The plant was also used as a toy. It's recess time at the local school, and Thomasine has taught the children to make pinwheels using the asphodel stems, a modern version of a very old game. Asphodel was also used for learning. Thursday used to be a day off for Corsican school children. The tradition was to go to the fields, collect asphodel stalks in groups of 10, and in the process, learn their decimals. But the most profound use of this plant was the role that played in the rights of the Mazari. Les Mazari organisaient des, des battues dans la nuit du 31 juillet au 1er août et se battaient à coups de tiges d'asphodel. Après, euh, on, on utilise aussi les, les tubercules d'asphodel euh, pour allumer les feux de la Saint-Jean. Or, les feux de la Saint-Jean, c'est aussi euh, une tradition très importante. It was important because it was the evening of the night fight. Using whips made from the stems of asphodel, the Mazari, in a trance known as the spirit state, would fight a Mazari from a neighboring village. It was believed that the winner would bring good luck to their town for the next year. The children reenact an old game that Thomasine has taught them, the game of asphodel. It's a game of chance that symbolizes how a Mazari is chosen. A burning stem from the plant is passed around the circle from one child to the next. They chant a Corsican song. and It describes a kind of exorcism performed by the priest if you're caught. When the stem of the asphodel is spent, the last child to have held it is caught. It becomes the victim. They're the Mazari. It's believed in Corsica that you're not born a Mazari. It's the luck of the draw. Les autres enfants barbouillent le nez et la, et la bouche avec le charbon ainsi obtenu et ils se moquent de lui. Colorer ses, ses organes, donc le nez et la bouche, revient à arrêter la, la respiration, la vie. Donc l'enfant le, bascule de manière métaphorique dans le monde des, dans le monde des morts et il, parce qu'il endosse la, la, couleur, la couleur noire. It's not what I would call a very nice game for children. It's actually rather morbid. But Thomasine explained to me that in superstitious times, this game would have allowed children to realize their own mortality. Mais en fait, euh, les Mazir ne, ne donnent pas la mort. Ils la prévoient seulement. Et ils peuvent, mais leur vision se rapporte tout à la mort. C'est pour ça qu'on dit qu'on dit que les Mazir sont des tueurs. Mais en fait, non. 
mais leur vision donc se rapporte tout à la mort. Euh, donc, ils peuvent avoir deux sortes, deux sortes de, de visions. Alors, soit lorsqu'ils sont tout petits, vers 7 ou 8 ans, eh bien, ils se rendent compte qu'ils ont des, des visions. Et là, s'ils en, en informent tout de suite leurs parents, eh bien, ils, ils peuvent subir le deuxième baptême dont je vous ai parlé tout à l'heure. Thomas, do you actually know a Nazari, like in your village euh, je connaissais un Maxir, mais actuellement, il est décédé. Et euh, maintenant, on dit que le Maxir n'existe plus. Parce que ces, ces Maxiris-là existaient parce qu'ils croyaient beaucoup, euh, non pas en Dieu, comme on le dit, mais euh, en Corse, on dit on, on croit en quelque chose. Donc, euh, ce quelque chose, on ne sait pas ce que c'est, mais c'est une entité à l'eau humaine. Et on, on croit en quelque chose. Or, aujourd'hui, comme la foi s'est estompée beaucoup, eh bien, euh, on dit qu'il n'y a plus de Maxir. Moi, le, le dernier Maxir que je connaissais, eh bien, il est mort euh, il y a quatre ans. Asphodel grows wild in the tough terrain of the rugged Corsican mountains. It has few practical uses in Corsica today, but somehow it remains at the heart of their culture. Thomasine told me an old saying about people who leave Corsica and forget their roots. On ne connaît plus l'albache. Ça veut dire tu ne connais plus l'asphodel. Et cela signifie qu'il est qu'il s'est vraiment trop acculturé et qu'il ne qu'il n'appartient plus à la civilisation corse. In the past, asphodel helped to feed people in Corsica. But more importantly, it was the vehicle that carried their traditional stories forward. As the asphodel plant grows and flowers each year, it helps to keep the folklore of this culture alive. When we come back, we'll visit a forest and churchyard in England and the folklore that lives there. When I arrived in England, I couldn't help but notice how plants are everywhere. They're part of everything, from an ivy-covered cottage to the very names of homes and businesses, like the Arden Thistle Hotel in Stratford-on-Avon, or this tiny yew cottage in Wakehurst. Richard Maybe is an author and plant enthusiast. He says the reason the British are so plant crazy is because England is one of the most urban countries in all of the world. It's natural for people to cling to anything related to plants. We met at the Cherry Tree Pub near Oxford. His recent book is a collection of letters from people all over Britain about their relationships with plants. He says it's natural for people to give meaning and symbolism to nature. On all occasions when we need to commemorate a place or a time in our lives, be it birth or death or the meeting with a future spouse or whatever, um, the vegetation that has been around us and in flower maybe or in leaf or maybe in more somber occasions actually from leaves falling from the trees um, attaches itself to that occasion. Richard believes that plant folklore connects our lives to the natural world. While science can tell us the reason leaves fall from the trees, it's folklore that identifies and helps us to remember those moments in life. You know, the folklore of, of a forest, and particularly in the, in the stories I've read as a child and read to my children, uh, is rather, uh, well, let's say it's a negative folklore for a forest. How, why is that? I think it comes from the fact that we don't know very much about woods in this country. It's, uh, if you go back 2,000 years, we only had 10% of the natural forests left in this country. Was, the rest had been cleared by the Iron Age for farms and settlements. Wow. And I think that out of that developed an attitude towards woods that regarded them as foreign places where damage or danger would occur. The trees in this beechwood forest are centuries old. In medieval times, these trees were considered the workhorses. They provided firewood for humans and nuts for cattle. Well, this is a magnificent wood. This is really spectacular. It is wonderful, isn't it? And, and round here, beech woods are sometimes called natural cathedrals. That's a little, little bit too solemn for me, but um, <laughs> Seems what, appropriate. I, what I did like was when I was growing up, hearing the adults around me refer to beaches in the feminine. They were all she's. Really? And the big beaches were called queen beaches, not, not king. And I think it's a, a kind of compliment to their gracefulness. One of the things that uh, happens to them around here a lot is that, that people carve graffiti on them. Oh. Um, uh, yes, I mean, not, not just, not just their, their own names, but love messages and whole poems. And mm -hmm. I've seen messages from uh, GIs from the last war in some, some of the beaches oh, around really? here. And is that an old custom? Or? Well, yes, it, uh, it goes back to the Romans. And indeed, there's a Roman proverb for it that I can't quite remember. But it means, in translation, that as these letters grow, so shall our love. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Richard's favourite story about the beechwood is the one that describes the heart of folklore. It's how human culture and nature 
connect. The story came from a woman in Yorkshire about a strange neighborhood tree they called Nellie's Tree. Her father, when he was young, was courting a woman in the next village in Yorkshire and used to walk up and down a railway line every night to, to court her. One evening, and I think he was feeling particularly romantic, he noticed he was passing three beech saplings, young beeches, and he decided to, to plait them together into the shape of an N, grafting them at, at both, both corners. And the grafts took, and 50 years later there is this gigantic N in living beech by the side of this railway line in Yorkshire, and everyone knows it as Nellie's tree. Across the street from the Cherry Tree Pub is the churchyard, built in 1190. Now, this 12th century stone church is surrounded by plants of ancient folklore that's still popular today. Now this looks like a rosemary plant, mm -hmm. several hundred years old. Look at the size of the wood here. It's massive, isn't it? It's amazing. Now what's the significance of rosemary? Well, it's always been symbolic of remembrance in this country, and Shakespeare has that phrase, rosemary for remembrance. And uh, it's often put on graves as a, as a memorial marker. Um, one of the plants it is. Hmm. Uh, I'm awfully fond of the, uh, of the smell. Perhaps that's what makes it so memorable. Indeed. <laughs> but it's also evergreen, and you notice that quite a few of the plants that are significant in churchyards, like the yew, are evergreen. Richard, why is it we find so many yew trees in the churchyards of, of England? Well, people have been trying to answer that for many hundreds of years, and no one is sure yet. But the remarkable thing is that the yews are almost certainly older than the churches. There are maybe 500 churches in Britain that have yews over 2,000 years old in. And the tree being so old, the, the, uh, the foliage being evergreen, they symbolize for people um, the, uh, the infinite and the immortal. And they're usually planted on the side of the church that's nearest to the exit door uh, during funerals, so that the cortege actually passes past the yew. Is there anything significant about the berries in the yew tree? Well, they're widely believed to be poisonous, like the foliage. Um, but in fact, it's only the little seed inside the red covering that's poisonous, and uh, uh, some adventurous country kids like scaring their parents by putting berries in their mouth and apparently swallowing the whole lot, but in fact uh, saving the pip to spit out. Uh, the kids call them snotty gogs here because oh. of their, their wonderfully viscous fluid inside. <laughs> well named. <laughs> According to Richard, children often play a vital role in plant folklore. I love some of the names that kids have invented for plants today. I mean, things like aluminium archangel, um, for, which is a Scottish name for a, for a particularly uh, silver-leaved plant that grows in Glasgow. And I, I love one of the games that um, some children invented for the explosive seed pods of one of the balsam family, which was a, a kind of a limp, olympiad for, for seed projection. And uh, they were able to, to have, have, have a games with these things and project the seeds. I think the winner got 12 yards out of them. Modern relationships with plants are as much a part of folklore as the ancient ones. Richard says it's a mistake to think folklore is just something old. What I think we've tended to do, in, in the West anyway, is assume that folklore is a, is a thing of the past, that it's over, that we are much too sophisticated and industrialized ever to bother with such things now, and we correct them with science. Now, I think that misses out an important kind of effective bond we have with, with the natural world, and that those kinds of relationships are being constantly renewed. That is, that we are making up folklore as we go along. It is a living thing. It's not simply a collection of old myths. We continued our walk through the British countryside, down a road and past the churchyard, and almost every plant we walked past, Richard knew a story about its relationship to people. There's all kinds of interesting plants. I'd recognize some nettles in there, and I think we have some poppies along yes, here. Yes, poppies there. Now, they, they get a bad slap, you know, as being a weed. Well, they're one of the world's most successful weeds, I mean, that it grows where human beings don't always want it to, but oh. um, it is so successful as a weed right throughout the globe that um, no one actually knows where its original home was. Now, its significance in folklore? Because of its extraordinary blood-red color, it's always been a symbol of life coming out of disturbance or death. And that association goes right back to classical times. You find that the poppies were sacred to the Romans, for instance, and attached to their, their corn god. And it goes through the medieval period in this country when um, there were various superstitions attached to the picking of poppies, and right up, of course, to the First World War, when the great rash of poppies that came out of the battlefields um, inspired one of your own countrymen, a Canadian, to um, actually start the idea of using poppies as a commemorative device for the First World War. That Canadian was soldier Colonel John McCrae, and his poem in Flanders Field inspired Remembrance Day. Now, I should like to pick one of those. But well, no, you shouldn't, because one of the tradition says that um, you, you, if you pick poppies, you'll start a thunderstorm. So, please. <laughs> we don't need that. Well, I didn't start a thunderstorm, 
but I was starting to understand the importance of folklore. We know the science of plants, and we know why they reproduce and why they die. In England, I understood why they touch our lives. When we come back, we're going to the jungles of Malaysia to search for a rare carnivorous plant with a reputation. The Cameron Highlands is a three-hour drive from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia's capital city. See that mountain peak on the right? That's where we're going, into a cloud forest. Inside, there are Nepenthes plants, commonly called monkey pots, or as rural Malaysians say, the devil's cup. To help me find these elusive plants is Gary Lim. He's a member of the Malaysian Nature Society, a non-profit group dedicated to teaching people about the jungle. This is the only way in here, is it, Gary? Yeah, it's the only way in and the only way out. Oh, oh okay. so we have to come back? This yeah, way. to come back. Wow, that's to, pretty steep. To see this. How often do you, you do this uh, light hike? Well, uh, as often as I can find time. It certainly is a workout. Yeah, mostly over the weekends. How high might we get to the, when we whoa, when we reach the peak? Now for about about two hours. Really? I mean, it's quite exotic, but yes. I'm looking forward to seeing these yeah. Nepenthes. Okay. Oh, well done. Okay. okay, my turn. Oh. The jungle was like no jungle that I'd ever been in before. It was very wet. Deep, thick, dark green moss grew on every tree trunk and branch even on the jungle floor, which made it very spongy to walk on. It was a steep climb, and we hiked up 3,700 feet. That's when the clouds set in. Well, Gary, it just instantly got foggy and kind of cool. Well, this is exactly why we call this area the cloud forest. Okay, if you look at plants at this level, most of them have very sharp drip tips, okay? Uh -huh. Because the area is constantly wet. So as the cloud moves in, okay, the water droplets sometimes are prick or they get latch onto the plants. This is quite the trek. It's like standing on the trampoline. How do you do it just in sandals? <laughs> Don't you ever slip? <laughs> the reason I use sandals uh, is because that when uh, there are leeches, I can always find them. Leeches? Yeah. Gary Lim is at home in this jungle. He's been climbing in here for years, bringing school children to corporate executives and teaching them all about the Nepenthes plant. This is like a swamp. It's really kind of neat, though, eh? You're sure we're going to find some? I mean, I've only seen these things in books, yes. so... Uh, you have to go underneath here? Yes. Oh, well, you'll fit. Thing. I don't know about me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there are some there. Where? Yeah, look, the big ones. Okay. Take me up there so I can't All see right. them. Of course, I don't really know what I'm looking for. Okay. Let's move here. Get a good view of it here. Where? This one. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, wow. This is really something. Yeah. Look at them all. Is there water in them? It's just... Yes, yeah, there could be. Oh, yes. Oh, there is a little. Okay. That is really neat. you find any insects? No, no bugs. Okay. Unless that's one. I don't think so. Now, tell me. This is a burning question. There's a lot of folklore around these plants. Yes. You know, monkeys falling in. What's, what's the scoop on this? It was thought that monkeys drink from this cup, okay? As you can see, there are liquid inside. The monkeys do, according to the locals and the Malays, as well as the natives in the area, drink from this, okay? Because according to them again, that if you, the monkeys drink from it, and after that, they get the energy and the sweet voice to call out, either to declare their territory or to mate. The water that I poured out of that, that pitcher onto my hand, could I have drunk that water? that most of the time if there's a collection of water in it and water is still clear, there's not too much of uh, sediments or dead insects underneath, it's still quite okay to, to drink it. But the best is probably to drink, if we are in need of water, to drink from close pictures, okay, where the lid is still closed when it still has not opened. There are 32 different species of Nepenthes in the world. Most are found in Borneo, but three of them are found only here in the highlands of Malaysia. 
And because they're only found at certain altitudes, deep in the jungle, local people consider them evil. If you look at this plant, okay, the shape of the plant itself, okay, most of the time in local folklore, a lot of things create interest. Most of the time, the time is because of the physical feature of the plant itself. The fact that the jungle is a harsh environment, extremely wet and damp with very poor soil, contributes to the folklore of this plant. Nepenthes is actually a carnivorous plant. It eats insects to survive. We identify the picture by the lip here, okay, and they have actually sugary glands around, okay, which attracts insects. This nutrient is actually obtained from the animals, the insects, okay, which are found, or have, which get attracted to the secretion and they fall in, okay, and those that can't get out anymore, those are slowly digested, okay, and the nutrients are absorbed by the plants directly. The pitcher part of the Nepenthes is actually the leaf of the plant, not the flower. It grows along the end of a tendril from its roots. Small pots squat on the ground and others hook on the vines via the tendril. This enables the plant to find insects in both the air and on the ground. It drinks water via these fuzzy hair-like fibers that coat the back of the leaf. When the mist moves in, the penthes drink from the clouds. A mysterious plant for which some locals have found practical uses. The water is quite clear and it's sterile. So the Malays use them also to wash their eyes because it's sterile, so it clears, it clears the eyes. At the same time, they cook rice in it, the largest one where you can find something like four pints of water, and that's the Raja. In, in local language, Raja means the king, the king of species. Okay, so that would be a good place to cook your rice, actually. Do you have a favorite folklore of any plant? Yes, I think uh, I like the folklore on the monkeys, okay? Being, having a sweet voice you know, after they drink from this picture. Okay. Maybe I'll have to try that. Yes. What's up over this hill, I wonder? Okay, Maybe we'll go. find something yeah, else. So I'm getting wet right. down here. Okay. This was the most exotic jungle I had ever visited. It's full of interesting plants, but none as fascinating as the monkey pot. Plants like this, the rare Nepenthes, or the innocent-looking asphodel, or the blood-red poppy, they all contribute to the folklore that describes the intense personal feelings and relationships that people the world over bring to plants. Folklore helps us to explore our cultures and continue our traditions. It allows us to express those emotions that are so close to our hearts, and it adds magic and mystery to the rituals of everyday life. I'm Ken Beattie. Join me again next time as we journey through the Earth's Garden.